Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dr. Ruth Lucinde. I'm a member of the KMA Research Committee, and I'll be your MC for tonight. Um, we're just giving time for uh, some more people to log in. So we'll be starting in a few minutes, uh, probably in the next four minutes. So yeah, let's just give it some time. It's 7.05 p.m. on the dot, at least according to my watch. Once again, Karibuni everyone to our um, webinar today. Um, my name is Dr. Ruth Lucinde. I'm a member of the KMA Research Committee and I'll be your MC for tonight. I hope you can all hear me. Um, could someone please confirm? Yes, thank you, thank you, Doc. Sawa Sawa, so... Um, the theme for today's webinar is scientific writing, and today we are very privileged to be hosting Prof. Lukoya Atwoli. I'll be introducing him shortly, but I'm sure he's already well known to many of us in KMA. Um, before that, however, allow me to acknowledge the presence of our KMA um, National Executive and National Governing Council members who've joined us this, this evening. Thank you so much. I can see you. And. Um, at this moment, I'd like to invite um, our president, Dr. Simon Kigondu, to make some welcoming remarks. Uh, Mr. President, Karibu. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, without uh, taking 
taking too much time, I would want to welcome everyone to this Kenya Medical Association uh, webinar. East Africa Medical in 2018. We are also thankful to the KMA Committee for facilitating this. Very excited to have my former vice president, uh, Professor Lukoya Tuoli, and we are pleased to have him. And uh, we are looking forward to his presentation. And uh, I will give back to Ruth uh, the presentation. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Sana, Mr. President. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker today, Professor Lukoy Atwoli. Um, Professor Atwoli is the current Dean of the Medical College of the Aga Khan University Hospital in East Africa. And he's a former Dean of the Moi University School of Medicine. He's a professor of, in psychiatry and he has extensive um, leadership, teaching and academic research experience. He is also a visiting scientist at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. And very recently, he was appointed as an honorary professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health in the Faculty of Health Sciences as, at the University of Cape Town. Um, so when Prof is free, which is rarely, um, he likes to hang out with his family. Um, he plays chess oftenly and He's trying to double out, double up as a golf player. He's trying out as as a golfer. Um, today, he's he's been he's been very kind to give us some of his time, and we are very very um, uh, we are very very thankful for that, Prof. So, Karibu, Prof. Um, before we start, I request everyone to keep our microphones on mute as the presentation is going on. Please um, use the chat box, the Q&A box, or the chat box to type out any questions, and we'll discuss them after. Karibu sana, Professor. Prof, you're on mute. Prof, you're still on mute. We can see your slides. There we are. I think I'm, un I'm unmuted now. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ruth and uh, Mr. President and the team for inviting me to speak about scientific writing today. Uh, it's my pleasure to come back. Uh, we had a series of webinars during COVID-19 that uh, I was leading together with colleagues on the executive committee, and I'm happy to be back uh, to discuss topical issues with uh, We call it a brief presentation, and hopefully, then we can have some time for question and answer to address more specific issues. But I will give an overview on uh, uh, what scientific writing is, um, how we develop research ideas, uh, how we disseminate research findings, uh, how we format manuscripts, and then we will conclude. So. Uh, scientific writing is a form of writing that is meant to convey scientific information to other scientists. So you don't do scientific writing for the general public or for the lay public. Scientific writing is meant to convey this uh, highly technical information to people who have a technical background in the subject that you're writing uh, about. Uh, it could be a research proposal where you are communicating the desire to conduct research in a specific area, could be a journal article where you're communicating findings from research or findings from a technical thing that you have done, communicating to your peers, a conference presentation that would format for a conference or a poster presentation that you have to format in a specific way. Scientific writing differs from other writing in very important ways. And the most important of this is that your target audience is scientists. So um, they're not people whom you have to start explaining things from first principles. They're people whom, about whom certain levels of knowledge are taken for granted. Um, and similarly, it differs based on the language. And I'm going to say a little bit about, about the language that we use in scientific communication and how different it might be 
from when you're writing a newspaper article or you're writing a blog or you're, you're, you're writing a social media you know, tweet or something. The key features of scientific writing, uh, as I intimated earlier, um, begins with the audience and the audience is other scientists. And so what this means is that we will not need detailed explanations of terms or definitions the way you would do if you're writing for a more general audience. These details are assumed to be obvious to the people uh, for whom you're writing uh, your manuscript or whatever scientific piece of writing it is. The second feature of scientific writing is the need to be concise and precise. You need to be clear in your language. Um, you know, flowery language, ambiguous, wordiness, redundant language must be avoided because the acreage in the scientific literature is limited and it's extremely expensive because uh, the amount of time a scientist spends reading your work, they could have spent it doing something else that might have contributed even more to growing the body of knowledge. So when they decide to give you uh, some time to read your work, then you must be quick to make your point and make it very clearly in language that will not be misinterpreted. The third thing is the context. Um, as you write a, a piece of scientific writing, you don't write it in isolation and it doesn't just drop from the sky. It is written against the context of previous work. Um, in science, we repeat the statement that we have only seen so far because we have stood on the shoulders of giants. And as you write a manuscript, as you write some piece of scientific writing, you must acknowledge that some work has been done before you and you're building on that work and that others will build on your work. So you have to place it in context. You have to demonstrate others have done it and reached here. These are the gaps in the knowledge that I'm seeking to fill. And this is how I have filled that gap. This is how I have advanced the body of knowledge, uh, even if it is by a little. So you have to demonstrate that. That's the issue of context. These are not things that are required for other kinds of writing. I mean, if you're writing for a general audience, you can be wordy, you can be flowery, you can you know, be circumloquitious, you can do all sorts of things because your goal in writing those other things might be to entertain, uh, might be to inform people about other things, and people will read that stuff at leisure, as opposed to people who read your scientific output for work. And now I'll move to developing a research idea because for you to have something to communicate, you have to generate the knowledge and then think about uh, implementing a study and then think about communicating the findings. And so I just have a few things to say about how we develop research ideas. And the most important attribute of a scientist is to be observant. And whether it is in your day-to-day -day work, when you're seeing patients, you notice a symptom that you haven't heard much about, uh, being observant in that way helps to advance knowledge by identifying gaps in the body of knowledge. So you try and learn as much as you can about a subject so that the gaps you observe are real gaps, not uh, gaps of ignorance because you haven't read or you haven't interacted with the subject as much as you should. So reading and observing, whether it's in the clinical setting, whether it's you know in the street, whatever, setting you find yourself in, being observant is the first step in developing a research idea. So as you observe questions, imagine your mind and you think about how does this happen? What is known about this and so on? Then you go back to the literature and read to confirm whether what you perceive as a gap in the knowledge, in the body of knowledge is an actual gap or is something that can be filled by you reading about the subject and understanding it better, then it's no longer a gap. And that cycle uh, you know, continues, it is iterative. Um, as you learn much more and more, uh, you are able to identify the gaps better. And so once you have confirmed that there is an actual gap in the knowledge and that the question you're asking about the observations you have made is a legitimate question whose answer is not clear in the literature, then you would generate objectives of a study to fill that knowledge gap. Uh, so you would turn that research question that hasn't found a satisfactory answer in the literature into a set of objectives that can be pursued in order to get that answer. 
And once you have done this, then based on what you now know, having interacted with the literature, you would develop a proposal and that proposal would have a methodology that would enable you to meet those objectives and answer that research question. And obviously once you have this, then you get the necessary approvals, whether it's human subjects, research approval, resources that you need to collect this data and you go out there and conduct the study. So a scientist's life I mean, is, is, is made up of a cycle of observation, uh, looking at the literature, coming back to the observation, uh, finding experts and asking questions until there's a point where the answers are no longer clear or the answer is that we don't know. And then this morphs into a research question, morphs into objectives that then guide you as you develop a methodology to try and answer the question that started this in the first place. So those are just ideas around generating or developing a research idea for those that are interested in research. So you've gone there, you've done your research, you've collected data, you have some findings, uh, you want to inform the world about what you have found. Um, the general considerations in dissemination of research findings are really, again, a stepwise process that first, you had this question when you went out to conduct this study, uh, and you now have some findings that you have uh, generated based on the proposal that you made. Going through those findings in the context of the research question that you had, can you extract a key message from your data, basically an answer to the research question that you started with? If you can do that, and this answer is something worth communicating because it is new, because it advances the body of knowledge into the gap that you had already identified, then you contrast what you have found with what is already known, which you have already interacted with. Then you would develop a manuscript centered on this key message, basically saying, I started out by asking myself a certain question. I went, developed a proposal, I collected data, and now I have an answer that uh, uh, takes care of a bit of the question that I started out with. And the manuscript central message will be that answer that you have uh, generated, that answer that you have developed from your uh, research. And so once you have the manuscript, so obviously in the manuscript, and we are going to look at the components of the manuscript, it is based on the proposal you had when you started the data collection, uh, grafted onto the results that you have found, and then have a section that discusses those results and a conclusion that really addresses the research question at the beginning. So once you have this information, this data, these tables, you would want to quickly identify a journal that usually publishes this kind of work. So this is where we are talking about a scientist communicating to fellow scientists. You would find people who find this kind of work interesting to them, or people who do this kind of work for a living, or people who would benefit from the information that you're going to give in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and when you start out, we usually talk about low-hanging fruits. If this is the first time you're sending out a manuscript for publication in your entire life, uh, number one, uh, send it to the journal that's available to you. Uh, don't worry too much about its, its uh, impact factor because uh, you're not yet there. And then secondly, as you send them out to these journals, prepare for rejection because rejection is often the norm as you start out. Uh, as you become better and better, your chances of rejection reduce, but they never get to zero, especially with the very top journals. The chances of rejection are often more than 90% for most of the manuscripts that are sent out to them. But if it is rejected, you go to the next journal and go to the next journal if you believe that you have an important message to communicate to the scientific community. So once you have that journal, you format your manuscript in the style of that journal. All journals have uh, information for authors that tell you how your manuscript should look like for them to even consider it for publication. So make sure you have meticulously followed those instructions, structured it exactly as the journal says you should structure it, whether it is the referencing and citation, whether it is the font, whether it is the sections that you must have in your manuscript, make sure you meet those requirements for the journal uh, before you send it out. Now, if it is a conference presentation or a poster, again, you have to format uh, this information in the style 
of the organizers of that conference or of that poster uh, session. They would tell you this is the size of the poster, this is the information you have to include in it, and so on and so forth. So make sure you follow those instructions uh, to a T. Uh, and then you would submit and wait for a response. Often uh, for the journals that accept very few manuscripts, you will get a very quick response from the editor saying, you know what, we have hundreds of these kinds of uh, manuscripts being sent to us, and we are sorry we can't accept all of them. Uh, we suggest you send it somewhere else. Uh, some of them will actually go through it and then send it to reviewers, and reviewers might tell you this doesn't advance the body of knowledge and they would reject. Or if you're lucky, then they would give you back comments. You'd work on those comments and have a greater chance at being published. This is a format of manuscripts in most of the medical journals that uh, we submit to or we review for uh, or we read. Uh, most of them will insist you have a man an abstract uh, and then you'd have an introductory section and then you must have a detailed method section. Uh, you have to present your results in a certain way. You have to synthesize or discuss them and you have to have clear conclusions and you may have recommendations based on the work uh, that you've done. I'll delve in uh, a little bit more detail in each of those sections. Uh, in the abstract, you're expected to summarize the knowledge gap that you're seeking to fill in one or two sentences. So basically the entire background in your paper is uh, compressed into one or two sentences that say, this thing is a big problem in the world and it needs to be addressed and nothing has been done to address it so far. And then you would state your main objective, which would be, I have set out uh, to solve this problem, or I have broken a chunk of this problem, and it is the focus of this uh, paper. And then you have a section on methods within the abstract where you would then very briefly, but clearly describe the methods, ideally identifying which instruments you use, the population you studied, where you did it, uh, and the analysis that were carried out. So it's it's a bigger section than than the others, but then uh, it shouldn't be more than four or five lines uh, describing what you've done. Then you present your main findings again in very very summarized form, usually addressing the specific objective that you set for yourself. So they might end up being two, three, or four main findings that you're presenting plus a description of the population that you studied. And then in the abstract, you would have a concluding section that directly answers your research question. If your research question was, what is the proportion of people with COVID-19 who do not leave the ICU, your conclusion should give that proportion and say, in this study, we found that this proportion of people with COVID do not leave the ICU. So it answers your research question or addresses your main research objective. And ideally, this should be the main message that we talked about. I have a message to communicate. That message should be framed in that conclusion uh, very, very clearly. Now, into the body of the manuscript, uh, this has been described by Trabek et al. in, in this uh, paper that they wrote in ECHO uh, 101 about how to write a scientific paper. And they say it's an hourglass-shaped uh, concept where the introduction starts out broad and then narrows down to your uh, study objectives into the methods, what you're going to do, and then the results. And then the discussion starts broadening it out again and the conclusions and implications locate it back into the body of knowledge that it is trying to advance. So you start broad, narrow down to what you can do as an individual or as a group, and then look at the results and broaden out back into the body of knowledge to see where do you locate your findings how do they fit in with what other people have done? So this structure generally uh, is what I would recommend that you use as, 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 as you prepare your manuscript for, for submission. And uh, in more detail, the introduction is usually very brief. Uh, think about it as a set of paragraphs, three, uh, maybe four or five paragraphs at most, with the first paragraph introducing the concepts or introducing the problem. Um, the second paragraph giving the state of evidence on this topic, what has been done, what is known. 
the third paragraph identifying weaknesses with the existing evidence that then justifies you to go in and do the study. And the fourth paragraph, which can be combined with the third, states the knowledge gap. What is the problem that I'm setting out to address? And the last sentence or, or so in this uh, manuscript in the introduction states the main objective of the study, that in this study, we set out to do one, two, three, four, five things. Then the most detailed section after the results in my view, or together with the results, is the methods section. Um, here you would be required to be more detailed because most of the people looking at your study will not look at your results or your main message before going through the methods with a fine tooth comb because it is the methods that tell them whether they can trust your results or not. If your methods are bad, nobody will bother with your results. So you have to be as detailed as possible in a way that allows another person to replicate your study if they set out to do it, um, and therefore, so that they can compare the results with what you have found. So you will state what study population it was in as much detail as you can, where you carried out the study, when you carried out the study, what tools did you use? And you describe them in detail, giving references and justifications as to why you selected those tools and not others. Uh, then you will describe how the data was collected. Once you have described everything, the setting, the tools and so on, you say, so this is how we collected the data from the first person who was recruited to the last person and the procedures that were carried out in between. Then you will explain what your analytic plan was. How did you analyze the data? Uh, how did you determine the outcome variables? How did you treat the various pieces of data that you collected? And then you will give all the approvals. You will indicate ethical approval, administrative approval, all those things that were done before the study was carried out. So in other words, the methods is telling the reader, uh, this is why you should trust the message that I'm going to give you in my findings. It is because I was meticulous in how I collected the data. I collect, I, I, I controlled all the processes. And if I tell you that this finding was significant, trust me, it was significant because of how I collected the data. When you get to the results section, uh, again, it is a concise and clear presentation of results aligned with your previously outlined study objectives. It is not the space for fluff. Fluff doesn't exist in the results. Fluff can be put in the introduction, in the discussion, but the results are a clear and concise presentation of your results. Um, usually you start with a description of the study population in the first section, whether they are males, females, age, gender, whatever it is. And then you will follow it with sections that have narratives, tables, and charts that address each of the objectives very, very directly, uh, preferably presented in separate sections of your findings. Uh, if it is a manuscript, the sections would be delineated by how you organize your paragraphs. Um, so you would have a section that deals with the first objective, a section that deals with the second, a third objective, and so on. But the narrative should be the one that summarizes the main findings in line with the objectives. So if the objective was to find out how many children get pneumonia uh, during the rainy season, uh, as a first objective, then you would be saying, in this rainy season, we went out and looked at 100 children, and out of those 100 children, 30 had pneumonia. You answer that directly. And then the table and charts will give a lot more detail that is summarized at a glance, so that uh, you don't have to repeat everything that is shown on the chart in the text. Um, and then, so you avoid discussing your results at this point. You're not discussing them, you're just presenting what you found, uh, rather than saying, but this is because, you know, this is what happens, the pathogenesis. And so that is not the place to do so. That will have its uh, space in the discussion. Here, you just present what you found after what you did in the methods. Then the discussion section, um, it is best if this section also follows the same sequence of the objectives and the same sequence uh, that you organize your results in. And for each main finding, which maps onto one of the specific objectives, you discuss that finding uh, in itself. Then you compare and contrast with what other people have found. And then you highlight what it adds to the body of knowledge. And you could even speculate about the meaning of this finding uh, based on now understanding of other things, basic science knowledge, uh, epidemiological knowledge, and so on, 
you could start speculating and saying, perhaps this is why this was so big. Perhaps this is why this was so little. Perhaps this is why this was so different from what other people have found. And in your discussion, you'll also point out limitations and weaknesses in your study methodology. And if you did anything to mitigate this. Um, and then finally, you will highlight the strengths of your study as well, because uh, it's not it, the reason you're communicating these findings is because you think you're doing something meaningful. And those strengths, you also need to be very explicit uh, about them. Then conclusions and recommendations. Uh, in the conclusion, again, you will state the main finding of for each objective very clearly and concisely, basically repeating yourself to say, now, nah, after I set out to find out A, B, C, D, this is what I found. As concerning the first objective, this is what I found. The second objective, this is what I found, and so on and so forth. You answer the main and subsidiary research questions as directly and as clearly as possible. The conclusion is not where you do fluff, it's not where you hedge, explain, speculate. You've already done that in your discussion. Here you just state the conclusions as they are. You may also have recommendations that flow from those conclusions. And for instance, you might have found that there's something that needs to be done in a clinical setting that is not being done enough based on your findings. This is the place to bring them in and say, you're recommending that people start doing more of that thing. Uh, this is the benefit of your study. This is how humanity benefits from the work that you've done. These recommendations can be the knowledge gap, improving policy, practice, education, and even recommendations for further research. So in general, that is how I would uh, frame it. I decided to look at scientific writing and narrow down to manuscript writing for journals such as the East African Medical Journal, or to other international journals that are peers to the EMJ that usually require that somebody writing for them follows uh, this kind of schema in general. Thank you very much. And I think we can uh, take uh, questions uh, from here. Thank you. Back to you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, for the very succinct and informative presentation. Um, yes, we'll be moving to our discussion and Q&A session. And for this session, I'd like to invite Prof Okeo, um, uh, Chair of the East Africa Medical Journal, to join us as a panelist. Um, my colleague at the KMA Research uh, Committee, Dr. Nchafato, will moderate this session. And afterwards, we'll continue with the meeting. But thank you, Sana Prof. Um, yeah. Professor Keo, Dr. Nchafato, please take over. Um, for the rest of the group, um, you can post your questions, um, comments in the chat, and we'll discuss this. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks very much, Ruth. And uh, thanks very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Lukoya. Really good uh, hearing from you. Uh, very nice and succinct presentation. I'll get the Q&A session started off. Uh, Prof, I know you said uh, rejection is a norm uh, in, in this business of publishing. Um, uh, sometimes you, you, you find you don't get an outright rejection uh, or the reviewers come back and say, go and change ABC kinds of things. Uh, and, and some of those uh, you might, as a scientist, where you, from where you stand feel this is probably asking too much. Uh, I wanted to probably just make a comment on pushing back some of those reviewers' comments. Uh, some people who are new to science or haven't done this much more might feel, uh, you know, if I, if I have to do everything that the reviewer is asking for. Is, is, is yeah. there room for someone pushing back some of those comments and saying, look, uh, we can't really yeah. achieve ABCD, yeah. Yeah, so it is true that uh, there are some reviewers who tell you to do things that you didn't set out to do, or uh, you, if you did them, they would change the context, they would change the complexion of the work and change the message that you wanted to contribute. Um, it's okay to explain that in your response to the reviewers. Uh, it's okay to restate what you set out to do. It is okay to restate what your key message in your manuscript is and how it would change significantly if you did what the reviewer wanted to do. However, and I would caution that uh, it's not common that this happens. 
usually most of the reviewer comments are meant to improve your work so that your message comes out more clearly so that you address gaps that you might not have seen. So it is advisable when you're sending, when you get comments from reviewers to try as much as possible and see how you can address them while keeping your voice and keeping your message uh, in, the, in the paper. So there are times, yeah, there is, for instance, I've sent out a, a, a paper for review and I've gotten a reviewer who told me, uh, you should have analyzed for this as well. And that would have meant changing my study methodology. That would have meant uh, rewriting the entire paper to uh, accord to what this reviewer wanted. So I, I, I wrote back and I said, so this wasn't one of my objectives. Um, I think it is an interesting uh, suggestion. Um, it is something that I'm willing to consider for my next manuscript. Uh, but for this particular manuscript, these were the objectives and this is how I set out to do them. And uh, I do not see that this suggestion fits uh, in with this manuscript. Often the editors uh, will moderate this conversation and the editors, if satisfied with the explanation, would allow your manuscript to go as it is. Uh, great, perfect. Uh, thanks very much. And, and Prof. Keo, please feel free to uh, make additional comments uh, to that. I'm just opening up the Q&A box and uh, looking at what, what's been posted there. So the fellow called Sam Jaggi, who's asking results section, say something when the start is a proposal. I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, Sam Jaggi, if you just want to un, uh, un unmute yourself and I'll give you a chance to very quickly ask and clarify that. I'll quickly move to uh, Francis um, Ridley. Hi, hi, Dr. Gidai, good to see you online. Uh, it says, thanks for the presentation and wants to know something about mind mapping. Uh, before uh, the start of writing, what's the best approach and uh, if there are any guides uh, that you'd recommend. I think this is quite philosophical, but I'll let you handle that prof. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are people who do mind mapping. So mind mapping is about uh, trying to have the idea you want to communicate, putting it on paper and trying to fit things in a graphic way before you start writing and, 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 and so that it keeps the idea in a place where you can actually see it and see where it is going, where it's coming from. Uh, frankly, I do all that inside my head. I, I don't do that on paper. I think a lot about ideas. I organize them in my own head. So when I start writing, uh, they flow in a certain format in my head. So I don't necessarily do mind mapping on paper as people would do, but I, uh, I organize my thoughts in my head. And how I organize them is around that key message to say, so for instance, um, we looked at uh, outcomes, um, mental health outcomes for children who are uh, exposed to adverse childhood experiences, for instance. And the key message, for instance, we were comparing three groups of children, those who, orphaned children. So one group of orphaned children are living with family Uh, prof, I, I lost you there a bit. I was that when we compared children, oh my my, I'm sorry, my uh, connection gets a bit uh, off. Uh, okay, okay, good. Yeah. You can hear me now. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So as I was saying, uh, so I, for instance, there's a study that uh, we were comparing three groups of orphan children. Uh, one group that lives with their family uh, and relatives, another group that lives in a children's home, and another group that lives on the street. Looking at that data, what struck me most was that there was more bullying among children living uh, with family, with relatives, than children living in children's homes. So we had expected to see more bullying in children's homes than in the family. And so this became a message that I built a manuscript around, uh, bullying and its effects, PTSD and other things. But then the key new knowledge being that children living, often children living with relatives are being bullied more than children who are living in children's homes. Um, so with that idea in the center of the mind, then you build everything around that. What are the methods that you used? Uh, what are the results support this finding? What do you have to control for? What does this mean? And what do you conclude from it? So that's what I do rather than uh, the mind mapping that many people do like notes or something on, on, on paper. 
Uh, perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. I'm going to just uh, invite Prof. Okeo here to also tell us whether he does any mind mapping. And then Prof. Uh, Okeo, <laughs> there's somebody who also wants to know is EMJ a branch of African Medical Journal. So as you talk about that, I also want you to make a comment. And I see Dr. Yonga is on the line as well, uh, our editor at EMJ. Please feel free to also uh, chip into this. Prof. Okeo, please. Well, well thank you, Dr. Nchafaso. And uh, Professor Lukoi, I'm really grateful for you to have found the time. Uh, uh, I think uh, one of the questions that uh, Chafaso is asking, you're probably in a better position to answer because of uh, institutional memory, but we are not a branch of that institute. To my, to my knowledge, uh, Professor Lukoi will confirm that. Um, yeah. I wanted to, uh, in uh, Making a few remarks, uh, first congratulate uh, Professor Lukoi for uh, breaking it down really in a simplified form, applying the lens of um, a reviewer to give uh, um, potential writers uh, uh, what they need to do to get their paper right through. Uh, one of the challenges I have found in reviewing is that uh, being sure that you have covered adequate literature review so that when you say you say there is a gap there is indeed a gap that for me is a challenge in the current space where people seem apparently not to have enough time to have covered the adequate literature and if they did they would find that what they are qualifying as a gap is not really a gap the second area is in uh, in the approval when you have uh, collaborative uh, researchers especially from abroad, and they have uh, obtained approval from an overseas uh, institution, uh, do they still need to have a local ethical approval? I am currently looking at one paper that apparently seemed to have ignored one uh, approval from the local uh, uh, authorizing agency. And then when you are presenting the results in the analysis, uh, we accept that uh, we are not all statisticians and we may apply uh, uh, statistical applications and interpretation in a way is not, which is not precise. Where is the place of uh, one getting a hold of a qualified statistician and acknowledging them accordingly um, to improve uh, uh, the, the, the the value of uh, and, 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 and the acceptance of uh, that analysis that is there in your, in your result. I'm particularly impressed by the hourglass uh, analogy of uh, presenting going broad and then narrowing down to uh, local country settings. And in the presentation of results, uh, I don't know if we still uh, uh, start local and then broaden out or then uh, international and then uh, drilling down to local context in the presentation uh, rather than in the formation of the idea itself. And finally, I want to just uh, say that um, lots of time writers uh, put in too many recommendations for one paper. And uh, some of those recommendations may not arise from the index, uh, index research that has been carried out. When we do graphics, uh, it's good to remember that the gra graphics are meant to, to uh, what make the, what you want us to see more precise. So sometimes I see graphics that are probably not, uh, uh, are probably not necessary. For example, presentation of binary variables. Uh, thank you very much uh, again, uh, Professor Lukoi. Always great to, uh, in your company. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Prof. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to allow this. Uh, there's a fellow called Sam Jaggi. I think uh, the question that uh, had been asked there was if somebody is writing probably uh, uh, a review where you don't have, uh, not a review, a proposal, for instance, for a research, uh, what do you say in the result section before? Uh, you, you have done any in, any work? Uh, Sam, uh, do I have your answer, your question right? Just uh, yes, unmute yes, and you do, you do. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, I'll pass it to Prof. Prof. Atoli. Yeah. 
Okay, before I address Sam's question, um, I think there were certain issues uh, um, Professor Keo raised. Um, I think I, I can't emphasize enough. If you're doing research in Nairobi, the recommendation is that you must have ethical approval in Nairobi, no matter whether you got approval in Harvard, whether you got approval in New York, whether you got approval in London, you still have to get ethical approval in Nairobi. And the reason being, when you send out your, your proposal for review, uh, the people reviewing that proposal need to include somebody who has local context, somebody who has a chance or who represents the people who are within your study population. Now, if you get approval in Harvard and come and do your study in Nairobi, the people who review that manuscript probably do not include anyone who represents anyone who would be in your study population. And so that review is not complete. So local approval, absolutely important, absolutely necessary. Can you get statisticians to support you in your publication? Absolutely. So you can have a statistician as a co-investigator who helps you design the methods right from the beginning. And that is, I think, ideal. So that they are involved in the study from the time when you're conceptualizing it up to the time when you have data and you're handling that data, the statistician will be very well placed to help you. But in case you don't have that, you can also pay a biostatistician to support your work, in which case you would acknowledge um, their contribution, but they're not necessarily co-authors because they have not gone through the entire range of authorship requirements. Um, I think the rest of the comments you made are very welcome. As for Sam's question, if you're publishing, I'm assuming the question is whether when you're writing a paper that describes methods, right? A methodology paper or something like that, or a proposal. In the, in the context of a proposal, maybe for your, you know, like the yeah. dissertation. So a proposal, a proposal will not have results. Um, if you're writing a proposal, you are proposing to go and collect data. So a proposal will have uh, a section of introduction and background and literature review that frames the problem that as you see it and places that problem in the context of what is already known. So that is going to be a significant portion of your proposal because you're trying to convince the person reading it that the problem you have seen is a real problem, is an important problem, and is a problem worthy of spending research resources on. So that segment will be relatively big. Then you will have your, object, your, your objectives after doing your rationale and justification you will have your objectives that will then flow very clearly from the problem you identified or the question you're trying to answer. And then from that, you will then have a large methods section, very detailed methods section that tells the reader that based on the problem I have identified and the objectives I have distilled from this question, this is the method I intend to use to answer those questions. And that is going to be pretty huge, a huge part of your, of your proposal. And at the end of your method section, you would have your ethics statement, you would have your, if necessary, if required, you'd have a budget to say, these are the resources I will require to carry out this data. And then you'll have your references. And in the appendices, you'll include whatever instruments you have determined to use to collect this data. You will not be expected to have results at the point where you're discussing your, your proposal. Uh, great, thanks, thanks very much, Prof, for that. Uh, uh, I'm trying to. I see we just have ten more minutes to go. There's quite a few questions that have come through the chat, and I'll, I'll try and summarize some of uh, those that I think a lot of people want to know. Uh, uh, when submitting, I think journals require exclusivity. Uh, they say don't submit your work to any other journal, and and someone, some people are having concerns that it, the review process might take quite long uh, with certain yeah. journals. So how long should, should someone wait uh, before sending this to other journals? And in, a, in, in line with that is also a question on uh, submitting abstracts for conferences. Can you, you know, sometimes yeah. a conference just requires you to send uh, you know, a, an abridged version. Is it okay to send an abstract be, before uh, you've actually written the whole manuscript? Normally we say the abstract should be written last before, uh, after the whole paper mm -hmm. has been written. So in the context of conferences. Doctor, yeah. so first before you move on, if you yes. could just uh, ask Professor Lu Atuli to confirm that idea of East African Medical Journal being a branch of some okay. other, yeah. Uh, okay. 
Okay. okay. Yeah. So a quick one on that one. The East African Medi Medical Journal is a journal that is wholly owned by the Kenya Medical Association. It is not owned by any other entity. It was established by the Kenya Medical Association as a successor to the British Medical Association. Um, and it has been in publication almost 100 years. Uh, in the next six or so years, I think we'll be celebrating 100 years of the East African Medical Journal. But it is wholly owned by the Kenya Medical Association and run by a board that uh, is appointed by KMA and KMA seats on that board as well. Now, as for exclusivity, um, yeah, so the importance of selecting the journal where you are going to submit your manuscript is that you have to look at that journal, see its history, see how does it do its review processes and be satisfied that that is where you want to publish your journal. Because once you submit it to that journal, you cannot submit it to any other journal. Because if you submitted your paper to two journals and they both published, uh, that would look like you've plagiarized yourself. And self-plagiarism is a thing and it messes up your career as a researcher and as a scientist. So once you submit one journal, unless it is rejected or otherwise withdrawn, you have to walk the journey with that journal until the paper is published. So be careful about the journal you choose, knowing that these are the risks you run. Uh, can you submit it to a conference? Um, so there are many ways of looking at it. Before it is published uh, as a manuscript or as a paper, uh, you can discuss it at conferences and at workshops. But you have to be clear when you're doing so to say it is based on a manuscript that has been submitted to Journal X and is currently under review so that the results are not submit are not shared out there as though it is a paper that has already been approved. This is similar to the practice of having preprints on a preprint archive where you put it on a preprint archive, but you're saying this has not yet been peer reviewed or has been submitted for peer review. And this is just the draft that uh, contains the ideas that I had before peer review. So that's allowed, but uh, you have to be very clear and transparent about the entire process so that you don't mislead the person reading it. Uh, and in addition to that, Prof, I think uh, some conferences uh, normally want to publish uh, the abstracts in a booklet and the authors normally are given an opportunity to decide whether they want yes. their abstracts published uh, or, or, or yes. not. Uh, I just want to bring in uh, Dr. Yonga here. Uh, the, the, in the next uh, question here. So someone is asking, uh, does the EMJ have an option of paying money for someone to make the publication open access? And someone is asking whether EMJ is still PubMed indexed. And someone is also asking about the time interval it takes uh, for getting responses uh, from uh, reviewers in EMJ saying they felt it was a bit too long. Uh, Dr. Ayonga, are you able to just unmute and address some of the uh, questions around uh, the, the review process in EMJ and whether people are required to pay to make public uh, articles open access. Thanks, thanks, Nchapatso. And uh, thanks again, Prof. It's very good to hear from you again. Um, <clears throat> I'll quickly start from the last one. So um, currently we have um, a timeline of about um, six weeks from the time you, six to eight weeks from the time you submit your manuscript. Um, to the East African Medical Journal. And basically the pipeline is that um, when you submit your work, it is first reviewed by the editorial um, office to make sure that uh, all the author guidelines have been strictly followed. And then after that has been done, um, then that is when a reviewer is assigned based on their, on their specialty um, or as well as the methodological interests. And then there'll be a back and forth with regard to uh, maybe changes, maybe the reviewer may want certain things addressed. That should take maybe another three weeks. Um, and then until the supervisor, until the, um, from our experience, I think there's normally about two to three rounds uh, between the reviewer and the author. And normally that change takes about six to eight weeks. So at the very latest by eight weeks, if the author has satisfactorily addressed um, what the reviewer um, um, has brought forth, then the work is published. So we normally estimate between six to eight weeks. After eight weeks, normally, um, depending on where the challenge is, um, either the editorial office gets in, uh, in touch with the reviewer, if the reviewer is the one having delays, or gets in touch with the author. 
um, in case um, they've sat on their paper. So that's number one. Number two is uh, on the issue of um, whether um, EMJ still um, is indexed in Medline. Um, maybe Prof, uh, Prof Atwoli, uh, you, you, you have more historical knowledge on this, but to the best of my knowledge, I don't think at the moment we are still indexed um, on Medline. And that is something that uh, I know as a, as a um, in, in collaboration with the board, it is something that we are reviewing in case we are not yet indexed, how we get ourselves um, indexed um, again. Um, and then the third one, maybe in Chafatso, you can remind me what was the third issue? Uh, no, you, you tackled uh, them quite well. I think someone was just asking um, about uh, whether they need to pay to get the, to make the article open access. Uh, ah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So maybe just to get to that. So um, normally when authors, um, so that is one of the challenges we are, we are trying to address with the current platform we are having, because this current platform does not have um, open access features. In fact, when you interact with it, um, ideally, in normal best international practices, the moment you pay to publish in a journal, automatically your work has to be open access. Um, that is, uh, I mean, international best practice. Uh, the current platform you are using, um, I think, you, when you pay when you pay publication fees to the East African Medical Journal, there's also a fee that is paid to the publisher itself, which is, I think, African Journals Online. And then when it is published there, unfortunately, if you want to retrieve, if someone wants to retrieve work. Um, from that platform, they have to pay, I think, another nine dollars um, for them to get the full the full publication. So, in a sense, um, I must say we, are, as EMJ, we are. It is something we are trying to address because we seem not to be very compliant with that. That you pay and your work is not open access. But that is something that ideally we are trying to address. The moment you publish work and you've paid for that work to be published, ideally your work has to be open access. So that is something we are we are trying to address within um, the journal. Thanks. Great. Th thanks, thanks, Dr. Yonga. And I think uh, the question of uh, payment for uh, publication and uh, you know article processing charges uh, and fees uh, is, is an ongoing uh, international debate. I'm, I'm sure most of us will remember that uh, at the beginning of the pan COVID pandemic, Nature uh, in increased their publication fees to almost nine thousand uh, US dollars. Um, and and, and, and that, that was met with a lot of resistance, just saying, you know, you're locking out uh, researchers from uh, low and middle income uh, country settings. Um, there is a question, a theme that is, uh, seems to be recurring, and it's a follow on to the comment that Prof. Atoli had made about uh, obtaining ethics approval uh, locally, even if uh, this has been obtained uh, uh, elsewhere. And I think the question is, uh, does this have to be obtained from a university institution or, or, or not? I think uh, there are certain research organizations such as uh, Camry uh, that yeah. uh, provide this service. And I think NACOSTI is actually the body that accredits uh, 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 institutions to be you know, uh, uh, reviewers. Uh, so a quick comment on, on that one, Prof. Atoli. Yeah, I, I think uh, you, you, you don't have to, there are many, many ethics review boards now approved, which are all approved by the NACOSTI, which is a national body that brings all of them together and accredits them. So it can be within a university, but it can be a research institution like Cambry. Um, and there are other institutions also that are setting up these ethics review boards. There are guidelines developed by NACOSTI to guide the development of these boards. Even our hospitals, some of them have ethics review boards that uh, you can use uh, for, for approving your research. The key thing is that if you're going to do research in Nairobi, you need to have an ethics review board in Nairobi, look at that work and tell you that it is okay to go ahead. At the end of the day, the role of an ethics review board or committee is to safeguard the interests of your study participants. And it is not possible for somebody to safeguard people he doesn't know or people he has never interacted with or people he, he can't visualize. So the local ethics committee, the composition is regulated by NACOSTI and the membership includes people from the community. So chances are you'll have somebody who will look at it and think, well, if my brother is going to be asked these kinds of questions, I don't think he's going to be comfortable. And then you as a researcher will be asked, how do you deal with that discomfort? And so on and so forth. Good. Uh, Prof. Okeo, I see your hand is up. Uh... Yes, Dr. <laughs> Professor, I just want 
I wanted to uh, to uh, to ask uh, uh, Professor Tuli to to just enrich and enrich the answer to the set of questions that were being responded to by by Yonga because of mm -hmm. institutional memory. Uh, yeah. So I can still make that request. Uh, uh, I think your your responses will certainly enriches all the responses that we make uh, because of yeah. your long-standing history. But I want to add another at, at the risk of. Uh, at the risk of talking too much about one topic, that one of uh, authorization. This is from my experience, uh, recent experience uh, in uh, trying to get an approval for a local research, whereby I went ahead and obtained approval from, from the, the uh, local university, but there is still insistence that you have to circle back to Nakosti to get another approval. I don't know whether, uh, um, that uh, is not mm -hmm. making yeah. the work getting approval too odious um, uh, because you have been in MPRH, you can also respond to that. But very importantly, yeah. just understand the answers that uh, uh, Dr. Yonga had made. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Okay. Back to you, Professor. Yeah, so I think, yeah, the Nakosti processes, they, 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 they were a lot clunkier at the beginning when Nakosti was starting to exert itself. So it was a lot more uh bureaucratic so um what is required if you're doing a study in kenya today uh one is that you will have an institutional research ethics committee look at your work and approve it and once it has approved it you will be required to submit it to uh, nakosti for approval as well and often nakosti will not necessarily take too long because the ethics review has been done by your local body they will just basically ensure that all processes have been followed for you to be able to conduct that study and they give you a permit to carry out that study. In the past, if you had approval and the study was only being done within a specific institution, the same institution that has approved it, you didn't require an acosti approval. You usually just required it if you're going out into the field. But lately they have been insisting that every study that is done, it has to go through Nakosti for purposes of record and monitoring of the kinds of research that is being done. Uh, they try to be very fast. I think two weeks to three weeks, you should get a response from them most of the time, especially if your study design is uh, straightforward. As far as indexing is concerned, we were indexed in the past with the PubMed and Medline, but then uh, at some point in the recent past, the regulations changed for either of those indexing uh, bodies. And uh, they had certain requirements that they said everybody has to reapply afresh for that process. But I, we didn't do so uh, for the reason that we were a little, we were very far back. We were several issues behind uh, for historical reasons that we have been trying to catch up. And I know Yonga has done a huge job in trying to catch up uh, with, with the time. Uh, so once you meet those requirements, then, uh, it would be possible for the journal to get back to PubMed and Medline and uh, whichever other bodies that do this indexing and get indexed with them. It's not difficult as long as your journal is coming out regularly and on time, then you can do the indexing. Uh, perfect. Thanks. I noticed uh, we're just three minutes uh, 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 over time. So uh, there's someone who's asking whether EMJ publishes only exclusive manuscripts uh, based on different cadres. I, I don't think there's any selectivity or they don't even, we don't no. even look at whether you are uh, a doctor, a nurse or, you know, allied health practitioner, as long as the science is good, yeah. uh, it just gets uh, published. I, I want to take, uh, we can't really have, uh, <clears throat> we can't, I don't think we can exhaust this discussion uh, in, in, in one session. So I want to just uh, take the very last question uh, to, 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 to you, Prof. Atoli. The, the rest you can probably answer them uh, in the chat box and this can be an ongoing discussion. Uh, remember, we normally hold these uh, webinars uh, every month uh, and yeah. we, can, we, we can follow them on. But there's someone who's asked, um, when where our study results are contradicting with the existing knowledge uh, by renowned researchers, and there's a high likelihood of rejection of such a manuscript by the journal or reviewers, how would one, especially a junior researcher, uh, go about this to uh, achieve publication? Yeah, so um, let me put it this way, that it is extremely rare for you to conduct a study for the first time in your life 
and get findings that contradict what established uh, research uh, has in the in the literature it is very 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 rare so when it does happen uh, i can tell you that the experts in the field will wake up and take notice if it is something that is really different really striking really new so in that regard then chances of it being rejected are not high especially if the paper is well written it follows the journal style and it presents findings that are striking and different. You will attract a lot of attention, you will attract a lot of questions from the reviewers, but uh, you will not necessarily be rejected because what you found contradicts existing science. Uh, it is a poor journal or a journal with very poor quality reviewers that would reject a study purely based on the fact that the findings are different from what other people have found. Many journals would want to publish a paper that has findings that are different. It's just that the high chance of rejection or the high likelihood of rejection is usually because what looks like different findings from what other people have done is because of an artifact or because of a problem with your own methodology and that is why it is highly likely to be rejected uh, remember the process of scientific review is informed by skepticism uh, when i send you a manuscript that says certain things the job of the reviewer is to say prove it uh, so the first instinct is to say what you are telling me is not true until I read your paper and you convince me with what you have written that this is true and this is something that you have found. So uh, being rejected is the norm in science and when it is accepted it means you have you know, done a good job in describing what you have done and you have convinced the reader that the findings are actually valid and they are new and they are different from what other people have done. That is the attitude I use in submitting my manuscripts. Um, and then the other thing you'll notice is that knowledge grows in small increments. Where you find that your results have made a huge leap, uh, it is advisable to go back to your methods, look at them and convince yourself that they are beyond reproach. Look at how you have analyzed that data, make sure it is beyond reproach before you come to a conclusion that is a huge leap from what is known. Uh, in which case, your chances of rejection will be very low. Uh, Prof, I, I think, thanks very much. Uh, I, I know we had said that will be the last question, but someone has brought in a very interesting uh, aspect here of how to identify predator journals uh, yeah. and the characteristics of this. I think there used to be a Bill's list uh, for predatory yes. journals, but uh, Bill no longer publishes uh, that list. Yeah. I think he got into some trouble. Uh, when you yes. try to index uh, one of the big uh, publishing houses associated with nature and his yeah. list just uh, it became invalidated as a result of that. So uh, how, how do you advise people about recognizing uh, predatory journals yeah. and how to avoid them? Yeah. Thanks. So number one, I would say that we will need another session where we will discuss uh, in detail uh, predatory publishing, plagiarism, authorship, basically ethics in research publication. I'm happy for us to have another session to discuss that. However, um, a quick check for predatory journals is you find. Sorry, you know, I, I, I can't hear you. I don't know if it's me. And it ah, there you go. Now I can hear you. Uh, no, Prof, your audio is jumping in and out. I think it's saying uh, time is up. Directory. Uh, sorry. Uh, now, did, now I can hear you. Okay, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I was saying that um, there's a, a, one, one test for predatory journals is they look for you on email. And unless you are the world expert in the field, uh, journals rarely go into directories and look for people and then ask them to send publications. It's the other way around. You're the one who looks for a journal and send your publication. So a journal that solicits from you uh, should raise let, red flags. A journal that asks you to pay money upfront to guarantee publication, it raises red flags. Uh, you should know that this, this, this is a problematic one. Bill's list, I think, was archived and it is still useful. I, I think uh, there are many places where people have continued to build on it. Uh, you can still look for it and there are certain journals there that are you know, known to be predatory and you want to avoid them. There are many journals that call themselves World Journal of This or Other. International Journal of Interdisciplinary plus Entrepreneurship plus Health and so on. These vaguely titled journals, journals that are not specific to any field, 
should raise a red flag because journals are supposed to be targeted to a certain scientific community. If it is so broad, then who reads it? And what is it established for? So there are a few markers like those that uh, should raise a red flag. And if you're starting out, it is good to um, get advice from established researchers in the field as to what journals they think are reputable, even for somebody starting out. Don't hide and send a publication on your own to a journal uh, because you might end up wasting that work when it is published in a predatory journal. Uh, great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Prof. Atoli, Prof. Uh, Okeo and Dr. Yonga for the very uh, nice discussion session. I'm going to just bring this to a close, uh, recognizing we can't really tackle all the questions, but uh, as Prof. has said, uh, we, we should probably have a follow-on discussion to discuss the ethics and we can probably uh, follow up some of uh, these questions in uh, subsequent sessions. Uh, I, I want to hand uh, the meeting back uh, to uh, uh, Ruth, but before I do that, someone had asked whether the slides can be made available. And thanks to our KMA IT, and I see our president have posted that in the chat box. Yes, the slides are available uh, in a recording and they're freely accessible. Um, thanks. Uh, and and uh, I, I sent I, I sent them to the secretariat as PDF, yeah. and I think uh, she may share it with anyone who's interested. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much for that, Prof. Uh, back to you, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Harry. Thanks, Prof. Uh, this was a very good discussion. Um, so colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to close this meeting. But just before we do so, I'd like to invite our Secretary General, Dr. Diana Marion, to give us a vote of thanks, to thank our speaker today, our panelists, all of you participants, and to formally close this meeting. Dr. Marion Karibu. Uh, thank you. Uh, this was a wonderful session. As usual, I want to thank um, all the attendees for sparing their time and being with us. I want to thank the panelists for preparing for this. And um, more so, I want to thank uh, Professor Twelly for being the main speaker for this session. I want to thank all of us today. And as we pick uh, a few things uh, from this uh, presentation, uh, I want to also uh, put it forward that we can still consult beyond this session. And uh, therefore we put that open uh, so members can actually uh, be able to get our panelists and forward more of their questions, or if the questions were not answered, we can be able to facilitate that. Otherwise, I want to thank everyone this evening and wish everyone a very good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. Um, so now we'd like to close the meeting. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, good evening. Um, just a reminder, we have these webinars every month. So see you next month for our next um, webinar, the series. Thank you very Thanks much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, Goodbye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.